Hello and welcome to this video on friction in which we're going to discuss exactly how it is that we model friction in physics. In order to model it we have to think a little bit about what we think is the underlying source of friction. Now if we think long and hard and we know a little bit of chemistry then we can imagine that friction actually comes from the formation of some bonds connecting the various surfaces that are in contact. Then we might come up with a model based on thinking about the time scale to form these bonds and how strong those bonds actually are, how much effort it takes to break them, to describe how strong friction can be and how it changes in different contexts and with different materials. But that is way more detail than we want to go into. So instead we're going to have a fairly simplistic picture where we think about still the microscopic nature of the surface but only to the extent that we realize that no surface is ever truly smooth. It's always got some jaggedness to it and we're just going to model that jaggedness in a very simplistic way as essentially interlocking teeth. With this interlocking teeth model we can actually describe real-world observations of how friction works. So let's think about this. We've left two objects sitting on top of each other for some long time so they've had time to completely settle, meaning that the teeth are exactly and completely interlocked as shown in the picture. So if we're going to come along and we want to slide the top object over the bottom object, well as we push to the side we've got to actually lift those teeth completely out. That takes a lot of effort. But once we've done that, then the teeth are no longer interlocked and the object can slide happily. Now, it's not quite true. It won't slide completely freely because as it starts to move over, it still has weight which pulls it down onto the bottom object. So as a result, those teeth are going to start sinking back together. But they won't get all the way. Instead, they'll just go kind of halfway and then push back out and then sink as they move over to the right again and so on. So something like this, we free it initially and then they sink part of the way back and keep looping and just repeating that. Pushed it all the way out, then they keep sinking back in and just freeze it here. You can see that they don't get all the way back to being fully interlocked. This is sort of the last moment as we now push to the right we're lifting again. So that's as low as the teeth get once it's sliding. So sliding is going to be easier because we don't have to lift the teeth quite as far. If we have these teeth on something that rolls, then that rolling motion very naturally goes to lift those teeth right out of those teeth on the track, which is just the other surface that it's rolling on. With this model in mind, we can identify three main types of friction and we've already basically said what they are. They are the case when we're not yet moving. We call that static friction. Once we get it sliding we know that things are a bit easier so we call that kinetic friction and we know that if something is rolling well then there's even less friction because you're naturally lifting the teeth out and that's the rolling friction. So based on that discussion of our model we know that the static friction, its maximum possible value, is larger than that of kinetic friction, which is larger still than that of rolling friction. But how would we think about those actual values of each of those forces? Well, they have essentially the same model, and that is simply that the force due to friction is less than or equal to some constant, which we call the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And the normal force it makes sense if you think about it for it to be there because the harder I push the more I'm forcing those teeth together. So that normal force which describes the force existing at that point of contact of the surfaces is exactly describing how much you're pushing those teeth together. So let's take a look specifically at how we model these things. Well, in the case of static friction, 
it is indeed true that we use that full less than or equal uh, expression for our model and therefore we just adopt a special coefficient of friction for the static case and we multiply by the normal force and that force of friction is going to be less than or equal to that combination, that product. And the reason it's less than or equal to is because, of course, if I'm not trying to move the object at all, then friction has nothing to do to oppose that lack of motion. So if friction has nothing to do, then it won't do anything and the force of friction is zero. But if I start to push, then the force of friction will increase up until it reaches this value given by the product of the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now the other two, the kinetic and rolling friction, there, if present at all, are always equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And those coefficients are ranked in the same way. The coefficient of static friction is greater than the coefficient for kinetic, which is greater than the coefficient for rolling friction. All right, let's see how all of this comes together by thinking about a nice concrete example. So suppose Batman has been hooning around and he's locked up his brakes and he's called Superman to give him a push. As Superman begins to push, the force he applies will gradually increase and uh, as a result friction will continue to oppose that motion so the force of friction is going to rise up until it reaches some maximum value so here's that shown schematically and that maximum value is of course the coefficient of static friction times the normal force so at this point where Superman is pushing in such a way that the friction from all the tires exactly counters the force that he's pushing with, the car is still not moving. Suppose Superman decides to push a little bit more. So we see that in that little increase in the arrow. Well, the static friction cannot increase any further, which means that the forces are no longer balanced. There's an acceleration to the right, and the car begins to slide. But if it's sliding, then the friction changes from static to kinetic. And kinetic, we know, is less than the maximum static friction. So the friction force will drop as the car slides. And that drop is immediate. Now, suppose a little bit further, the Batman realizes that his brakes aren't locked at all, but they're instead actually just... Um, he's had the handbrake on the whole time. So if he releases that handbrake, then all of a sudden, immediately again, the friction changes from kinetic to rolling, and it immediately drops down to the value for the rolling friction, and things move along. This video has hopefully shown you how to think about friction, and therefore naturally shown you the distinction between three different types, the static friction, kinetic friction, and rolling friction. And hopefully you now understand exactly how those forces come about as we change the situation. And hopefully you also understand that static friction is anywhere between zero and the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, while the others are always the coefficient times the normal force, if they're present at all. To make sure that you understand, you can try tackling these questions. First, could you create a description just like we've done with the Batmobile, but now when Batman is actually just cruising along and then hits his brakes because he sees a crime occurring. So can you describe how friction acts as that happens and as the Batmobile comes to a complete halt? Can you also explain how friction works when the Batmobile is actually trying to speed up? And along those same lines, can you explain why friction is vital for us to be able to walk?